Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. All right. What is up? So nice to see you. Welcome indeed. Welcome. Okay. All good. Welcome. Come on in. Come on in. It's lovely to see you. My name's Jacob. What's your name? Cool. Um, where in the world are you right now? Where are you, where are you watching from? It's so nice to see all of your lovely names going past on the screen. We're here today not to play the U bass, though I wanted to get the U bass in tune for you, just because it's good vibes. We're here to um, do some questions and answers, and we're also here to uh, sign some posters, which I'll explain very soon. Wow, 3,000 people are in the house. It's quite something. So uh, let me explain what's going on there. Basically, right, um, I've got some incredible glow-in-the-dark posters, which may interest you. Uh, they also may not interest you. If they do not interest you, it's fine. No problems. But if they do, um, then you might be excited about this. So they, I'm interested by these posters. Basically, yeah, they, they glow in the dark. So if you uh, light them up and then you put them on the wall and turn off all the lights, as people do when they go to sleep often, then they will indeed glow. They'll glow in the dark. And it's a truly phenomenal feat of nature. Uh, what I'm going to be doing in this, in this live stream, if you'd like to stick around, is to uh, sign them all. Because I'm going to be selling them, basically. That's, I forgot to say that. If you want to buy one, you can. Um, I'm going to be writing down Jacob Collier. That's my name. Jacob Collier. This lovely silver... Ah, silver sharpie that I've never actually used before. It's brand new. It smells really good. Uh, it's funny. Funny. You should ask. And um, this is going to be the pen I'm using to sign all the posters. I actually don't know how many there are, but there's, there's only a few here. Well, actually, there's, there are a lot. There's a lot here. There's probably about... 100 and two, maybe 200 posters? That's either 100 or 200 posters. This is all I've got. I'm going to sign every single one of them. And if you'd like to, you can buy one on my, on my website. Uh, this is completely optional. But please feel free. I'm going to position the, just position the camera right here so you can see a little bit of the... Well, actually, you know what? Before, before we get into this, let's, just, let's flip the camera around. And let's, let's, just, let's, let's have a little ex examination. So I don't know if you can feel this through the camera. But, oh, I can. And it's it's really it's gorgeous. They're nice and thick and glossy, um, and I, I just got I just got them today. So it's it, the, the vibes are strong for sure. And what I was thinking we could do is is open this up to be a question answer session, and I'll be signing and I'll be asking questions because I haven't seen you guys in ages. It's so nice to see you. Um, so welcome to this little extravaganza. Now you we may also notice some of you may be noticing that I'm actually wearing also wearing this hoodie with my own name on it, which I wouldn't normally do if I was going out the house and having adventures because you know it's a bit weird, but. But this is this is actually merch. You can buy this, buy this merch if you want to too. So you've got a little. It's like a Jesse Volume Two pocket. It's so sweet and cozy, and you can put all acorns, conkers, put little leaves and stones in here. It's, you can put Glockenspiel, Glockenspiel Beta. It's going to be. Is it this inside? Are you going to go inside? Very nice. Oh, they quite hurt quite a lot. Um, and so so this is also this is also for you. You can also and if you look at the back, it says Jesse on the. This is just thing. So it's a hoodie. Not without me to sort of oversell this much. I'm actually really excited just to wear it in my general life. Um, and then underneath this, we're pleased to know there's also <laughs> there's this t-shirt here like this. And it says Jacob Collier at the top. And so yeah, basically you can do whatever you want. Um, but you can if you want to, you can just like get hold of some of this stuff. So I'm gonna put this back on because it's real comfy. And I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the QA thingy. I don't know how to do that, but let me put my through the sleeve. How are you all doing? Hey? Um, it's really nice to it's really nice to see you. Uh, yeah, it's true. I'm not very good at selling stuff. <laughs> I never really sell stuff. I just sort of just sort of do stuff. I try not to sell things too much. So, oh wow, I see that the questions thing is already filled up. Um, this is the first question, so I feel like it's it's apt to uh, to answer it. And as, as I'm as I'm realizing, I'm realizing what this is going to be difficult to write and to write and uh, answer at the same time. But let, let's get started. I'll, I'll I'll sign the thingy and then I'll I don't know how this is going to work. We'll figure it out as we go along, just as we always do. Okay. So okay, I'm just, I'm going to do. I'm going to oh, see another questions, but okay, okay. Let's answer. Let's answer the question first, and then let's uh, move on and do. Okay. What is my favorite sound? 
Well, I do like this sound. It's like one of my all-time favourites. And you have that sound too in your mouth. You do that. You could do that if you want to. Um, I just like the sound of the U bass. So I just freshly tuned because it's really warm and um, kind of it's like well-rounded, grounded, rounded sound. It's not too uh, not too shouty, not too many bad harmonics. Uh, strings are super bendy, but that doesn't affect the sound. Well, it actually does affect the sound, but that wasn't the question. How bendy are the strings of my U bass? But I'm still answering it anyway. And yeah, so the U bass here is is uh, one of my favourite sounds, but really you can make a sound out of anything in the whole wide world. This room that I'm in right now, it's the room in which I'm quarantined, is filled with things that make really interesting sounds. I'm trying to find something cool to show you. And then I'll, I'll sit down and do some sign. But yeah, like this, take this for example. This is a little metallic object that I once stole from a somewhere. So I, I shouldn't tell you where because I might get in trouble. But don't worry, it wasn't like a bad, it wasn't a bad stealing session. It was fine. But it's really interesting and it, it makes this resonant sound, but you have to kind of throw it. Ah, oh, just throw it in the air. It goes like, it's like a cymbal. So this is a sound I enjoy a lot. I, I consistently find new and interesting sounds to, to love. And you can too. Uh, but I, I basically have made it a bit of a bit of a mission to fill a room with things that make sound that I like. Like, this is the gong. A gong. It's a gong, it's nice. Um, we could literally go on and on and on, just making sounds. Maybe that's what you want me to do. I don't know, I don't know. That's my interest. Jethro, it's quite quiet actually, it doesn't make much sound. But he, he guards the glockenspiel, which does make sound, but not today, it doesn't make any sound today. Um, cymbals and drums. I think really one of my favourite sounds actually is your voice. <laughs> it's one of my absolute favourites, because it makes such a nice uh, sound when you use it. Man, I miss touring a lot, and when I go on tour, I often get the audience to sing stuff, and we improvise chords and rhythms and stuff like that together. So that's always, that's always fun to do. Um, yeah. Okay. I think I've, I think I've answered the question, but thank you very much. I think it's Maria for ask, asking that question. Um, okay. Well, here, let's, let, let, let's do another question, shall we? Hmm. Wow. The, so I've got five people here asking what my favorite chord is. There's a few, a lot of, lot of questions actually about chords. It's funny, I've never been asked a question about chords before. Uh, but I guess there's a first time for everything. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go against my plan. I'm gonna take this out of the tripod. So what's my favorite chord today, I hear you ask? Well, my favorite chord today is probably, um, ooh. You know what, you know what, I, you know what I keep coming back to is just this. I keep coming back to this chord. It's really, really lovely. It's like, it's like this. Like that. And obviously, you can do underneath, or you can do on the top. It's nice. It's quite dramatic. It's quite nice, though. Um, it's another chord I like. Oh, earlier when I was playing this chord, which I think is really gorgeous. It's nice. And then if you move the C, it gets tenderer. It's nice. Then we can repeat the whole activity. See, some, some chords you think, oh, I don't like, don't like that one. But then it resolves and it feels, all feels good. There you go. There's just a few of my favourite chords, because hopefully I'm to answer all the people who asked about what my favourite chord might be. Um, where did I put mine? Here it is. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get started and do some... <laughs> I, have, I have a purpose. I have a purpose today. And the purpose is to get this poster signed for you. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that right now. Um, and let me see if I can find a question that would take a long time to answer because then we can all hang out and, <laughs> yes, yes we can. We can hang out and, and answer over a long period of time. Ooh, let's see, wow. Well, this one is gonna be a bit of a lengthy answer. So let's, let's, get, let's get stuck in, right? The question is, I've always wondered, so it's actually not really a question, it's more of a statement, but I can convert this quite easily into a question. 
and I'm gonna write Jacob <laughs> Collier smiley face because I always do it tends to do a smiley face. Can you guys see that? I hope you can. The question is, well, the statement is I've always wondered what London smells like. And to be honest, I'm sure there are people that um, that could answer this question with with more kind of uh, legitimacy than I. Uh, I I don't often leave my home, especially in th this year. I don't often leave my, my house in London when I'm home because often if I'm traveling, then uh, then it's really exhausting and really fun. And I come home and I, I want to just be, because I'm, I'm, su I'm such an introvert. So I, I tend to be at home a lot of the time. Um, so in terms of smells, I can give you some of my absolute favorite smells of London. Most of them are within this house. So here's one. My mum's apple pie, it's a good one. Highly recommend you smell it. Though you don't have a choice, most of you will never smell that smell. It's quite sad news, but the truth of the matter is, that that is a that is a smell that few have smelt, but those who have smelt it will never forget it. Same goes for her her bolognese. She's just in the other room. We just had supper as a family, and now we're signing posters and asking questions on Instagram Live. Well, I am. Um, freshly mown grass. You, do you, you guys avid lawn mowers? You get into lawn, mowing lawns? Because I am. And if I say so myself, um, when you, when I've mowed the lawn, or when anyone really has mowed the lawn, and, and you smell what's going on. It's a really gorgeous smell, beautiful. Um, I like the smells in London uh, that like urine in a deserted street. It's really gorgeous, nice smell. Uh, and if you go, if you walk around London, you will find you will find that some alleyways have this smell. It's very very distinctive. Um, there is a park in London called Kenwood. Uh, it's actually part of Hampstead Heath, as many of you guys may know Hampstead Heath, and. Um, and in Hampstead Heath, there are these uh, these old baths that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Like the people used to bathe in them, um, yeah, about, about I suppose two hundred years ago. And those baths have a very particular smell, which accompanied a lot of my childhood. Uh, now you mention it, so that is that's a good smell in London that you may enjoy. The, the River Thames smells good as well. The River Thames smells like um, yeah, deep naff, <laughs> um, populous. Smells like people have had opinions of it, you know? When the more opinions something, the more opinions people have of things, the more they smell. And here's another interesting piece of news that you may or may not have realized. If you make eye contact with somebody, then you can smell them better and they can smell you better. That is not true, but I feel like it is also maybe true. So it's up to you to decide. Let me know in the comments if you've experienced this kind of sensation yourself. Just let me know, that would be great. Um, so yeah, overall, to conclude this answer, London is a is a smelly place to be, but it's really good, and I'm I'm very appreciative of all of the green space that we have left in London. Like actually, quite local to my house, they're trying to set up this thing now where they're knocking down some. Well, they're actually not knocking down anything. They're removing some green space and they're building, uploading these buildings from their imaginations uh, to pieces of paper and from the pieces of paper to the lawn. <laughs> which means less smell of freshly cut grass, which I'm not happy about at all. And more smell of like traffic. Is that not one of my favorite smells actually, traffic in London. There's lots of it and there's probably about to be more after things pipe down, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, hope that, I hope that gives you a little insight into the smells of my life. Uh, like another smell I really like is the smell of freshly, freshly um, changed bedding. You know, when you change your bedding and it's like, and it's all crispy. It's like a cold crisp and you, go, you put your nose in it and it's just, it just, it's phenomenal. It's just totally phenomenal smell. But that's not, that's not a smell that's uh, specific to London. That is just a smell that's worldwide. It's an international smell. That is a few posters. Thank you for the question. Ray Mondoritzt underscore. That was really cool. Um, major, major smells, minor smells. Yeah, I see where you guys are going with this. Okay, let's answer some more questions and some more posters. Oh, well, here's one that may interest some of you. Uh, I get asked this question quite a lot. Um, when I was growing up here, so, okay, I should preface this by saying this room is the room, oof, so I've never used this pen, but it's running out of ink already. This, uh, this um, room was the room that I grew up in as a boy. And so I grew up listening to music in here, uh, making music in here, recording music in here, and Way back when, in the old days, I had, so oh, I had, so right now this is my little, this is where I've made like the last four albums of my entire life, just sitting in this chair. And 
this is my screen <laughs> and my red, be my beautiful red key monitors, which I just adore very much. Um, and when I was, well, before I was about seven, well, actually before I was about 12, the, the computer was like there against this wall, looking like facing same direction as the stained glass window. And, and then quite recently, about two years ago, actually, yeah, the setup kind of grew over the years. And like my mum used to teach in here as a violinist. Well, she's still a violinist, but she, she teaches now in the room next door when quarantine's not going on. And uh, yeah, I took over this room as, as an 11 year old when I, back when I got Logic. And yeah, this, this computer here, it was there for a long time and I, I moved it over here so I could have more space to use as a desk. And I actually, well, my, my friend Ben Bloomberg helped design this, this desk. Uh, it, was, it was built out of all of the wood that was originally was what built all of these shelves. There used to be some old Ikea shelves. You guys into Ikea? Because I am. And Ikea is really great for cheap furniture. And there used to be some Ikea shelves. So we, we tore those down, but to keep the same like essence of the room and the memory and the smells of the room, we, we used the, all the wood to recycle it and make this, make this desk, which I really love. And it's filled with concrete, so it never, ever moves. It's a nice, nice feeling. It's really reliable and solid. And so um, where was I going with that? Right, who's my favourite musical artist? Well, yeah, I, I basically grew up in a, in a household filled to the dunnels with musical artists uh, not like that my family are all musical artists in their own right but playing in this house in this room specifically was just a, a, a giant cavern of different flavors of music um and so stevie right stevie wonder if you haven't heard of him man you're in for a treat i kind of envy i envy you if you've never heard of stevie wonder because the, the journey that your ears when i go on is just kind of extraordinary but stevie was one huge one for me um, actually, I first got into his album Hotter Than July. Don't know if you guys know it's from 1980. And then uh, after that album, I got into like songs in the Key of Life and all that stuff. And it was just amazing. And I only realised really towards the latter half of my teenage years, I'm now 12, that Stevie Wonder actually plays all the instruments on the album. Well, a lot of the a lot of the uh, instruments on the album himself, which is just mind blowing to me and inspiring. So I I seek to do a similar thing. Prince was another one I loved growing up with. He wasn't with me, but I, I, love, I love his records. I love his fearlessness. I love his independence. Most of all, I love his funk. I think he's incredible. Yeah, unbelievable force of nature. Um, Earth, Wind and Fire, legendary. Joni Mitchell, legendary. Uh, he also grew up with Bob McFerrin. It's huge for me. I don't know if you guys have seen on YouTube. Uh, if you're a Bob McFerrin fan, you probably have. But uh, basically... Um, there's a concert. He he did. He used to do these concerts as a young man, when he was probably about my age. So I think he was about 28, so slightly older than me. I'm t I'm 25. I'm not 12, yet. And Bob McFerrin uh, did this basically a bunch of concerts called the Spontaneous. Or he did this one concert on YouTube called the Spon called Spontaneous Inventions, and basically him and a microphone and a crowd and his imagination and his voice and. He, he was really the first person I ever saw to play the crowd like an instrument. And he would give them a little thing to do and he'd ge use gestures to get them to change dynamics and all this amazing stuff. It was just one of the most profoundly incredible experiences of my entire life was watching this video of him. I think he sings Blackbird. Well, I know he sings Blackbird, actually. He sings Blackbird by the Beatles. You may know it. But he does it in this amazing way with sort of acrobatic singing where he goes like... I can't, I'm not very good at this, but he's really good at it. And so he does all these amazing intervals using his voice and he basically outlines all the harmony. He's able to concentrate on multiple levels of, of harmony, you know, all these different parts and he'll, he'll, um, attend to each of them sort of one by one, but the ear of the audience can, can perceive the harmony. Sometimes he'll do this in accompaniment of the audience's melody. And there's a video online of him singing uh, Ave Maria uh, over, the, over the famous C major prelude by Bach, which goes, do, 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 in that one. Um, he sings it. He sings that, do, 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 like beautifully in tune and unbelievable. And the audience comes and sings the, the, the counter melody over the top, which is just so gorgeous. And I really would highly recommend you check it out if you, if you don't know about it. Oh, it's mighty. It's mighty, mighty. And yeah, like 10 years after I saw that video, I, for some reason, went on tour and I started to goof around with audiences in, in a similar fashion. And so far, as I was saying earlier on, if you were here at the beginning of my live stream, 
it's such a cool experience to work with a group of singers, especially if nothing is planned, because what you realise is just how musical people are and how every, every single person has a voice. And that's so powerful. And on many, many, in many ways, on, on many levels, and using your voice is cool. And if, you, if you've ever sung in a group of people, you'll know this feeling. If you haven't, then um, you're in for a treat, if you ever do, because it, there's something profoundly special that happens when you combine your voice with other people's voices, like a whole community of, of people's voices. And it's, it's the thing that I dream most about when I'm idle and thinking about touring and obviously not able to go on tour is it's just like, yeah, 2,000 people singing together, upwards of 2,000 people singing together. And that is a really amazing thing, which I miss greatly. Um, a couple of other musicians I grew up with, um, Bartok, don't even know Bartok, massive rock star of the 20th century. Um, Bartok wrote an incredible piece of music. He's, he's a, I suppose, a, a, yeah, 21st century, a 20th century classical composer. Check out the Romanian folk dances by Bartok. Ooh, that's, that is heavy. Um, beautiful. Uh, people like Charles Ives and Benjamin Britten. People like Flying Lotus. Um, Thundercat, super awesome. Uh, Dirty Projectors were super important for me in my teens. Uh, Dave, yeah, David Longstreth, who's the lead singer of Dirty Projectors, his voice. Um, is unlike anything you've ever heard in your entire life. It's so unbelievably honest and so unbelievably fearless. And he really showed me that it was possible to, um, to, to sing in this way that was far less about accuracy and much more about feeling, much more about sensation. It kind of completely changed my life. So if you don't know David Projectors, you're in for another treat. They're amazing. Um, David Byrne, you guys know about David Byrne? Talking Heads? Um, if you, if you don't know David Byrne, you have to check him out. Obviously, check out all those amazing music videos. But there's an interview that some of you may have seen, if you've gone deep, on David Byrne. Um, he talks about, uh, well, he's in this massive suit. You know this video I'm talking about? He's wearing this huge suit that his shoulders go up to here. Jacob Collier merchandise, you can buy it right now on my website. And basically, the suit is so big that it makes his head look really small. And he dresses up in different outfits um, and sort of makeup thing and, and interviews himself. And one of the questions he asked himself is like, um, your voice, he says, your voice isn't very good, um, but you're a singer. Like, how, why, like, why did you do that? And, and he, he says this amazing thing. It's on YouTube, if you type in like, big suit David Byrne. And he says something like, the better someone's voice is, um, the harder it is to tell what they're saying, what to, to tell what they're saying. Um, which is so nice. And so he says that I use my voice to my advantage. Uh, because it, because it's not very good, and so people believe that it's me talking, which I love. It's brilliant, really, really profoundly wonderful. So, so there you go. That is a little splurge of artists that inspired me as a boy. I'm still a boy. I'm actually a man, but yeah. How are you all doing? It's nice. To, it's really nice that you're still here. <laughs> I, I've got through a couple of posters. There's actually quite a lot here. So, so it's nice. <laughs> nice, great. Yeah, it's very good. Um, Yes. Wow. Somebody is asking uh, here, can you name your five favourite female artists and musicians? Which is a very difficult thing to do because there are so many good ones. Um, but here's a few that I love really dearly. One is, um, uh, do, do you know Becca Stevens? Becca Stevens is really, really cool. Becca Stevens is an extraordinary musician. She, she's a bit like a sort of contemporary Joni Mitchell, I suppose. Uh, she has this incredible style, very, very lucid, free thinking style. She's also a really, really dear friend of mine. So she's amazing. Um, I mentioned Joni Mitchell earlier on. And I just mentioned her just now as well. Joni Mitchell is profoundly special. And I would highly recommend that you check out Joni Mitchell. Um, uh, other female artists that I absolutely adore. Do you know St. Vincent? Hello, I can't hear you. Yeah. St. Vincent is extraordinary and awesome. I mean, she's like so funky and she's such an incredible producer. And if there's one thing I've, I've felt in the last few years, especially in my collaborations with fem female musicians, um, it's that so many, uh, so many women in the, in the music industry have such strong instincts about how music should feel. But not enough women are given the tools to be producers at a young age. Um, and I think nowadays there are all sorts of tools out there for making music, but it's almost like the sort of mentality that men are the producers in the industry and that women turn up and sing is horrendous in my mind. I just don't understand it. Um, and in terms of you know, emotional intelligence with music, which is something I think a lot about, yeah try and operate in those terms as much as I can. All, all of the women with whom I've collaborated, from someone like Leanne Le Havis, whose album just dropped today, you should go check it out, it's beautiful. 
um, to someone like Dodi or Umo Sangari. Um, these people's instincts are just are extraordinary. Kimbra, I mean, yeah, Kimbra was actually my Spotify artist of the decade, according to my uh, algorithm thingy. And that, and so, yeah, she's incredible. Her instincts are just uh, are unreal. Unbelievable instincts that she has. And I've learned so much from her as, as a producer. I mean, not yeah, not just as like a friend and collaborator, but as a producer. And so if you're a, a woman or a girl or a young woman or an old girl, then please produce music because I think the world needs it. In the same way that the world needs female directors um, within the film industry, it's, it's, it's a lens thing. It's like learning how to see the world through a woman's eyes. It's profoundly important. And I was brought up solely by women. I, I'm one of three children uh, under a single mother. So women was, was is the whole of my whole of my home landscape. Um, so I, I always, I've always had an incredible sort of affinity with that way of thinking and that, that, that style, I suppose, of, of creating and expressing things. Um, but please, please get like, please get, get mucky and get involved in making stuff and like logic, get logic if you want to or get other stuff like Ableton, blah, blah, blah. But I would really recommend logic because I, I use it myself. Um, but yeah, there, there are so many. I feel like I've, I've covered, I've maybe covered that question now, but yeah, we need you. Use your, use your voices, please. Um, ready? We're going to do another question. 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 2, 1. Underscore, underscore, Liz dot, uh, underscore, underscore, L dot, I dot, Z, or Z as we say in the UK, dot, underscore, is asking, why the British are so great at music? Is it in your tea or something? Well, here's the thing. I don't think all Brits are good at music. Um... But I do think that there's something in the British psychology which is very forgiving of people who take risks. Also, people who are a bit weird. And I think that if you've ever been to Britain, don't come now if you're not in Britain, because you probably won't be able to. But if you're ever in Britain and you crack a joke, uh, so the way people laugh is different. And the way crowds laugh is different. And I really feed off being weird a lot of the time. Uh, and in Britain, it is socially cool to be, for example, like really awkward. I really love that. I love being awkward. So musicians, a lot, a lot of my favorite musicians are, are um, people who are very comfortable with being uncomfortable. And uh, in fact, I was watching an interview with St. Vincent the other day and she, and she said, uh, the, the interviewer said, hey, what is it that inspires you to make music? And she said, well, I'm inspired by the feeling of being uncomfortable. Which is interesting because for me, I'm, I'm, often, in, I'm often inspired by, by comfort, actually. Like I, I seek to create these bombs, these sort of incandescent worlds that I can get, get immersed in, I can, I can hide in, you know, I, I design them from the inside out. Um, that said, Jesse Volume 3 is real weird. But I, I find, um, I find that yeah, the concept of listening to the parts of yourself that are the strangest can be the most compelling. And I don't know if you've ever, yeah, hung out with a really funny, sarcastic, awkward British person like me. But if you have, then, then you'll know there's something really great about someone willing to be awkward. When I was about 19 years old, I did some gigs with an amazing uh, piano player. His name is Jason Rubello. And Jason Rubello is really is, is astoundingly good. He, he played with people like Sting. Um, still does, I think. And, uh, but he's also just an amazing pianist in his own right. And so I, I was in his band uh, for a while and we did, we did some gigs together. And he said, well, he said lots of things, but there was this one time on stage at Ronnie Scott's in London when we were playing. And he was loading up a, a synth sound on his keyboard system, a little rig, keyboard keyboard rig. And uh, let's make that J a bit nicer. Oh, and this one. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, there, there was like a moment in the set where he said, uh, oh, I'm just gonna load up, um, well, okay. So the thing is he had to change his sound between songs, right? Um, because he was changing his preset. And so he, uh, he went over to his computer and he and he he clicked a few things. He said, "I'm just uh, just checking my email." Like that, and his face was just like completely serious, and he didn't like smile or laugh and whatever. And the the room was kind of like, <laughs> and then like once that died down, it was just like <laughs> nothing. I was, I just remember I was just so wonderful. I just love that stuff. I absolutely love it. I love feeling like really weird and uncomfortable, but not not in a way that's like fuck you, you know, in a way that's just like, 
beautiful and hesitant, you know, and or just like decidedly, uh, you might not like this, you know. So that feeling I really like, and I think that is, I I, I really really miss it when I don't when I'm not in the UK. It's funny funny you should ask when I'm when I'm travelling, which I I do love to do, very much. Uh, people don't get my jokes. People people don't get my humour, and I'll say something and people will be like, ha ha ha, cool man. You know, especially in the US, it's like, yeah, man, <laughs> cool, man, yeah, great. And and for me, I, I love it when, yeah, you just leave something hanging and it's a little awkward. So I think maybe the, the human, the, the, I think maybe the humour in Britain has informed the music. And if you look, if you look at the past, someone like Hendrix, for example, Jimi Hendrix, don't know if you've heard of him? If you haven't heard of him, um, then... I don't know what that, I don't know what you've been doing, but Jimi Hendrix uh, came here in the 1960s, and we we got it, like we got we, we got what the vibe was, we 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 got what was going on. It was like, oh okay, this is this is someone with a really brazen voice, someone who's determined to be outrageous and courageous. And uh, the U.S., for example, took took longer to 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 get it, and I think it's because there was this friction in the U.K. that wasn't based in things being right or perfect or a dream like the US, uh, it was about stuff being mucky and real, and culture, like it's culture maybe too. So anyway, if you're just joining the live stream, hello, and I'm not saying that the British are all good at making music, if you're looking at the question wondering that, but I do think that the Brits have got some things right about how to let things be themselves without putting sheens on them, you know, like changing them or filtering them or... Uh, stuff like this, you know, like America. I, I do genuinely love the United States of America in many ways, mostly because of the people inside it. But the, the sort of mentality of the dream, I don't think it, I don't think it breeds a, a, the kind of creativity that excites me personally. Um, and then there's so many other countries of the world where music is good too. It's not just, it's not just Britain, it's not just the UK. So don't you go... Stick around. We're going to be signing some more posters. I'm going to answer another question right now. Um, hey, everyone. It's nice to see everyone's comments. Um, it really is. Uh, hi. Hello. Hello, indeed. Okay. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to answer another question. I'm just looking for some. For some questions. Toby. Doc Kimmelman. What is up, Toby? Toby's asking, "What's the background noise?" Well. Two ways I could answer this question. One would be to describe the noise that is in my house surrounding me right now that you may or may not be hearing as a peripheral kind of wash of monophone signal throughout your from your device. Um, my sister's practicing the double bass next door with a bow, like a classical double bass. Outdoors, there's uh, no bird singing. Basically, no bird singing at all. But there's some fresh air. You could probably hear that. You can hear the uh, sound of sound of some um, not so distant traffic if you really listen closely. You can also probably hear the sound of my squeaky pen diligently signing these glow in the dark Jesse Volume Three posters, which you can buy <laughs> if you'd like to, on online at jamescolly.com forward slash store. Uh, that's optional. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But I'm squeaking away here for you, so go ahead and just help a brother out, you know. Look at this. Oh, gorgeous. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so there you go. I mean, I, in terms of sort of figuratively, what's the background, what is the background noise of, of the world? Um, I think it's, it's, it's many things. It's a uh, collective consciousness, um, probably the sound of your ancestors, footwork um, in your skeleton. Uh, it's the sound of time going past. I was thinking the other day how time is exactly the right length. Exactly the right length. Nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's just, it's just the right length. Sometimes people think, you know what, time, something should go faster or something, but it's actually the right length. It's perfect. Time is really perfectly designed. or well, it's not designed. I don't know if it's designed. Maybe it's designed. Time is just, it's one of those profound things. So you might be hearing that as your background noise. It just depends on how you, how you use your ears. You can basically hear it hear everything and anything, and vice versa. Um, so, I don't know, what's your, um, what's your name? <laughs> what's your background noise if you're watching and you want to know something about you? Let me know in the comments. 
Next question. Thank you, Toby. That was a uh, was good. It's really good. Um, so here, here, it's a question here. Niku Pizza. He's asking a, uh, she or he, I don't know uh, what gender this person is, is asking about microtonal study. Um, I'm probably not the right person to ask uh, for some reasons. One is that I've never really studied microtones uh, formally. So I don't, I don't really know. Oh, let me just make sure I can see the posters that I'm signing. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I haven't really read any books on it. Um, what I have done is I've asked people that I trust uh, about microtones. So basically, on the piano, right, there's a few notes on the piano. Twelve in each octave. And you can divide those twelve, that space of, you know, C... C3 to C4 into literally however many uh, spaces you want. It's completely and utterly up to you. Like, you can do whatever you want to do. Every single rule, musically, is arbitrary. Every single rule. And so one arbitrary rule, music, is there are 12 notes. And sometimes people say, yeah, yeah, it's all well and good, man. Yeah, that's cool. But, you know, there's just it's all the same 12 notes. And it's like, actually, no, no it's not true. <laughs> no, because there's more than 12 notes. Infin infinite notes, actually that you can sing or play. Um, so I've recently got into a habit of dividing intervals into uh, increasing numbers of, of spaces and, and basically defining the piano. Because the piano is not in tune. I'm sure many of you guys know this if you're a Jacob Collier fan. I always talk about this, but basically yeah, the piano is a hoax. And semitones were constructed to save um, the people who constructed keyboard instruments in the 1500s money. Because an instrument that plays properly in tune uh, is really expensive to build. And so what it made more sense to do was to have, like, all, all, all keys are equal, all notes are equal, um, where you can modulate freely between all 12 keys and all the semitones are the same size. A bit like uh, a lot of the music here on the radio today is actually quantized, by which I mean that all the uh, divisions of the beat are the same size, like... They're, like, equally spaced. Um, a lot of my favourite music is... Uh, unquantized, like samba, or ganawa, or uh, ganawa in three divisions. It's not, it's wonky. So the same is true for pitch. So I got interested in microtones because I wanted to, you know, bend it. And I find that the more I bend stuff, the more interesting stuff becomes. And also the more I learn about myself from the thing I'm bending. Because uh, as the matrix, as the boy in the matrix says with the spoon, it's like, I don't, it's not the spoon that needs to bend, it's me. When you know, he holds the spoon and it's like, and it's like, I'm bending, not the spoon. I love that. Um, so, you, you know, you, you bend pitch around and one way you can practice it if you'd like to, which is not the same as studying. If you want to study, then you can ask her like a real scholar. I'm, I'm more of a, 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 I suppose I play. I play with these concepts rather than study them. But uh, you, you take an interval and you say like, G, E, right? <laughs> And you say, okay, so if I look at G and E on the piano, there are uh, there are two notes in between. You think that's cool, very nice. But then you say, okay, well, what if that's what if instead of it being you know three, well, four, four notes in total, instead of it being four notes in total, whatever, it's like five notes in total. What if it's three at first? You say, so they're equally spaced, but it's not real. It's not on the piano. Well, it is real, but it's not the piano. The piano's not real. So. Right, and then you go further. You go, right, and then you go, and 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 yeah, you can divide it as much as you want, however you want. And so this is actually really, really interesting um, for voice leading. Like if you're if you're an arranger like me, and you seek to make voices sound good together. Uh, then um, it is really fun to use these things. And I, I've talked about this before. Some of you guys may have seen interviews with me talking about this stuff before. But take, you know, like the Family Guy theme tune. You know, you guys watch Family Guy? He's bo a bo fa bo ne bo guy. Yeah. I, I love this as an example because, because if, if you do, he's a family guy. That's really satisfying as a contrary motion part to the melody. Do, 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 But the piano just goes do, 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 because it's blunt. It's like a blunt sword. But do, 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 do is unblunt. It's gorgeous. 
there's levity because it's delicate it's, it, but each it's moving constantly moving so that's really that excites me like when things are constantly moving in, in arrangements and harmony they sound really good because the ear is consistently twisted and surprised and it makes the resolution all the more satisfying you know what i'm saying so uh, yeah so so that so that's how i like practice uh, that's how i practice some microtonal stuff i mean there are all sorts of other things to do too like try um taking take a song that you like don't know if you like any songs but um any song will do and try transposing it up uh oh legs are getting tired um Try, try transposing it uh, up a semitone and a half when you listen to it. You can do this pretty easily. You can do this on like Logic or GarageBand or Pro Tools or Ableton or Reaper or um, FL Studio. Or you can even do it like in TikTok now. Uh, you can you can rate stretch songs. Just like move them around and put, put them in different keys and sing along and get used to the, the idea that keys aren't real. Like keys aren't, keys don't exist. So don't worry about being really... Don't worry about being too, like, yeah, too, too, too religious about keys because it's okay. You you can dissolve them. Does that make sense? Audacity. Yeah, it's true. You can also do them in, in audacity. Hi guys, <laughs> my name is Jacob Collier, and I'm signing some posters for you. We're doing a question answer session if you're just joining, and I'm about to go and answer another one. I'm looking at some questions, don't judge me. Um, let me see. Here's oh wow. Blimey, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions here. Um, hmm. Okay, here's one. Take your index finger and your thumb. Put your index finger on your thumb here as though, as though you're about to flick something. Yeah? Don't do it like too, don't, don't like, don't load it too, too much. Just like a little bit of tension. And then, and then, so leave that in your one hand. And then if you do this, then people will be like, oh, you know, but it's fine. So then with your mouth, you can, you can pitch the different notes. So I'm blocking, I'm blocking the back of my uh, mouth with my tongue, back of my tongue, like that. And I'm pitching it with that. If you do this, yeah. So all you're going to do is you're going to take this finger of your right hand or whatever it's hand you want to use, and it's going to flick, yeah, side of your cheek. But as you do this, you're going to like ascend the pitch in your mouth. So basically, you're going to go from low to high, really fast. And actually, if that's I'm doing that, I'm realizing that my tongue comes forwards, not like oh, but just like. Like that. So there you go. That is how you do the boing sound in, with your mouth. And everyone has a different mouth, so don't judge me. But yeah, you can. You too can do the boing sound with your mouth. That's the honest truth of things. Let, let's hear you now. Let's hear you just some. Give me, give me a nice boing. Good. Now one more. Is that a few more. Yeah. Try moving your tongue slightly faster. Instead of, you know, some of you doing this, just make it springy. Yeah? Yeah, that's a little bit better. That's, that's pretty good. One more time. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think you're getting the hang of this. Okay. There you go. That is the answer to Gemma, Gemma's question. Thank you for that question. Might be one of my favourites, actually, that I've answered thus far on today's live stream. Um, please, if you if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to, after this video is ended, um, please post a video of you doing the mouth noise, and uh, do hashtag. I'm trying to think of a good hashtag. Um, hashtag Jacob mouth noise. Yeah, no, Jacob, Jacob, um, no, Jacob, uh, Jacob mouth boing. 
Let's have that one. Jacob Mouthboy. Post your submissions on Instagram. I'll be checking them out later and reposting my favourites. Jacob Mouthboy. Hashtag Jacob Mouthboy. Boing, boing your mouth. That's the end of the story. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Writing boing doesn't doesn't mean you're doing it. I need proof. <sighs> I need I need I need more proof on that. Um, so from boing to <laughs> I don't know what something. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my outfit. From this, so this was my white hoodie, my Jacob Collier Jesse hoodie, and I really, really love it, and I think you would actually love it too. So go ahead and buy one if you'd like to. This is the Jacob Collier T-shirt. For this is all from Volume Two, the artwork for Jesse Volume Two. Which is look at this. I, I'm so prepared. This is my look. Hello, my name's Jacob. Blah blah blah. And then hello, my name's Jacob. These are my vinyls. If you want to, you can buy them. Um, There'll soon be Jesse Volume 3 vinyls, but before that, there's Jesse Volume 3 posters, but you already know that. So, um, what was I going to say about this? Yeah, so this is this. is This This here is this. And it's a real piece of art. And the art was made by this incredible artist called Astrid Araselian, or Aselian, Araselian. She's like an old, old friend of, of, of my, my mother's, and she's extraordinarily special in multiple ways. And this artwork, she, she painted the whole thing. It's a painting. It's actually the painting actually hanging next door. There's a little fly. Yeah. And so this is, this, all this was made out of this beautiful artwork. And so this is just Jesse Volume 1. Suit yourself. Suit yourself. And I'm going to change into the poncho because the poncho is like, I think my favourite of all of this, all of the stuff. Um, because it's really, uh, it's really nice. And, and it's all, it's the artwork itself. It's all, it's all here. Now, if you know me, then you'll know just how, just how much I love a good poncho. Poncho, man. Oh, I can get rid of... Oh, no, I was going to ask that question in a second. Okay. Yeah, so this is my... This is the... You can have one of these ponchos. Would you like a poncho? Okay, that's good to know. So go on to... Go on to jacobcollier.com. Jacob Collier. Not Collier. Collier. Smiley face. jacobcollier.com. And you can buy one. And actually, I believe, like, from the text I'm receiving from my team, they're selling out. I think that the, the Logic Session t-shirt is already sold out. <laughs> Thank you for selling it out. But if you want one of these, now's the time. Does someone you know have a birthday, for example? Do you have a birthday? Do you want to treat yourself? Does someone you hate have a birthday? If so, convert the hate into love and purchase a poncho, a Jacob Collier poncho, made with love, designed with love, worn by your boy, JC. Now, Nuss Kingpin is asking... What's the idea behind autotune? Well, the idea behind autotune is that you sing some notes in to... Oh, wait, you can't see my posters. No, you can. That's a bit better. The idea behind autotune is that you sing notes into your computer. Or what, you sing it into your microphone, and then the microphone translates it using magnets, or whatever the type of microphone is, into a, a signal which goes to your computer. And then you can basically make that... You can make those notes sound like they're in tune. Now... Don't get me started on this, because as I, as I just mentioned, if you were here about 10 minutes ago on this Instagram live stream of a uh, Friday afternoon or evening here in London, it's 10 p.m., you will know that the piano, which is obviously what Autotune adheres to as a system of tuning, is in fact not ideal for most, well, actually for lots of music it's fine, but it's it's not real. So so you can, you can put Autotune on a voice, and basically what it does is it rounds every note to the nearest note, you know? So if I go, ah, uh, then it will go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, because that's what Austin does. It just splits your notes into semitones. Um, that is all well and good if you're working with an equal, uh, uh, equal temperament, which is what the piano is working within. Suit yourself. Um, it's, it can be a really cool sound. Like, for example, a good friend of mine, T-Pain, uh, who's actually on Jesse Volume 3, now, feel free to just, like, freak out for a second, because I know that's big news for some of you. T-Pain is on Jesse Volume 3. He's an absolute champion, legend of his craft. He was really, like, he was one of the first guys to make autotune hip. And the reason was, because actually, if you've seen T-Pain's Tiny Desk concert, you will know he's, he's a badass singer. He can really, really sing. Like, he's an amazing singer. And uh, he uses autotune because he loves the sound of it, and it's an interesting sound. It kind of synthesizes your voice and makes it sound like... Yeah, a synth or a keyboard or whatever. 
something on there. Yeah. And uh, and so if you use it, if you, if you use it as a as a creative choice, it's like really badass because you know it's up to you. You can do that. Um, I think what can be what can be tricky about Awesome is when you lean on it like like a crutch. You know? Same same goes for all technology, actually. To be honest, um, yeah. Oh, this this post here has a, has a little line down it. It's the first one I've seen that has like a it's like a silk thread. So this one's very special, and I'll do something special for it. And if you get the one with the line on it, then then it's exciting. Um, I'm gonna do a heart next to the line. Okay. Um, so if you lean on technology as a crutch in anything in your life, like if you filter yourself all the time, or if you autocorrect your spelling all the time, or if you use quantization, and you're, if you're a rhythmic being and you use quantization, which is like you play drums or MIDI drums in and it rounds all the notes to the nearest beat, it's exactly the same as autotune. If you go, and then you quantize it, it will go, um, and all the notes will sound right. But the, here's, here's the catch. It's not right. It's just a choice. It's completely arbitrary what's right and wrong. No one said that if the beats were equally spaced, then they'd be better if the beats weren't equally spaced. And if you go to, if you go to Brazil, if you go to Portugal, if you go to Bolivia, if you go to Morocco, um, many, many places. If you go to Mali, if you go to, if you go to uh, Madagascar, if you go to, uh, to Ghana, if you go to Senegal, man, it's, it's completely wonky. All the rhythm is super wonky and the feel is so much deeper. Um, oh, it's different. It's like a different feel from techno. Right? But like... Ah, that stuff is cool. And so, same as you for pitch. If you get a chord which is in tune with physics and not in tune with piano, then you're really talking. And if you sing in a choir, or you play in a string quartet, or if you play trumpet in a brass sextet, or something like this, then you'll know, or well, some of you may know the feeling of being in a major chord, a bit tried and being in tune. It's just unparalleled. So special. So, 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 so special. Um, someone's just commenting, listen to the St. Vincent and David Byrne album, Love This Giant. You should definitely do that. Killer. So, so good. There's, this, there's a song on that one called, he goes... I used to think that I should watch TV. I used to think that it was good for me. What do you think of my David Byrne impression? Ah, oh, so, so badass. That album is just, uh, it's really good. So, appreciate the comment. Uh, but anyway, that's the only bad notes tune is that all of the notes in, in your song can be rounded to the nearest note. And obviously there's a fader. So, you, well, I actually don't have the Austrian plugin, so I don't know, but I have like a pitch correction plugin, which comes free with Logic that does a similar thing. And it's cool. You know, someone like T-Pain or Tide Sign, these guys make it sound super musical because it's like a, they're, they're singing like a, like a synthesizer. And it's, it's really gorgeous. Um, but just just beware. Beware that there are, you have choices. You have choices. Someone's commenting here, um, are these posters limited edition? Yeah, it's true. They, actually, they are limited edition. It's funny you should say that. There's... Um, this is how many. I, I've done this much already. They're all, they're all over here, all the ones I've signed. Like, there's my name. Yeah, there's me. I'm sorry, I'm the signer. That's the, that's the sign, signature. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're about halfway through this session. Please keep the questions coming. This is really, really good fun. Um, it's so nice to see you. Oh, it's so great to see you. You're looking really well. You look a bit hungry, but no, you should have some food. But yeah, I think that's good. Go ahead and buy some posters. Okay. Oh, Sam Amadon. Sam Amadon is in the house. Sam Amadon is an extraordinary musician. If you don't know him already, I'm sure many of you do. Uh, he's just a badass in every way. Badass, he's a singer. He's also a fiddler and a guitarist. He's also a banjist. Love me a banjist, but I'm not appreciative of banjists who um, beat me at table tennis. The other day, Sam Amadon came over to my house uninvited, on his bicycle, um, and uh, we hung out from a social distance, I, might, I may add, from a social distance. And uh, ping pong is a good activity to do from a social distance because it's almost exactly two metres apart. So there, there I was, there was Sam Amadon, and 
and we played at ping pong and he was damn good yeah it's just it's, it's, it's you can see him in the comments yeah he's he's really good i did i did beat him um but still and i'm not yeah i'm not i'm not I'm, I'm not the best table tennis player in the world but anyway me and sam had a really great time welcome sam amidon go check out sam amidon um oh, so many beautiful albums sam amidon's music accompanied me on my first flights um alone i ever took in my lifetime i don't even know if i told you this sam but i used to get on playing when i was about 20 and everything was kicking off and i was like jacob used to go to la now or something and i'd be like i don't know if i really want to go to la people don't laugh there um at my jokes uh, and I listened to um, I See the Sign, the Sam Odon album, and it got me through that whole period of time. So I'm really grateful to Sam. And you will be too, once you've gone and checked him out, if you haven't already. The question I'm, I've uh, put my, on myself to ask is from Jacob Helbig, who is a badass as well, actually. And the question is, how do you stay excited about making music when you're in a bad mood? That's the question. Well, I've never been in a bad mood, so I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I'm actually in a very, very bad mood right now. You just can't tell. I uh, know. Um, so... Moods go up and down. Life is a life is like a um, life is like many things, but on the contrary, um, life is brilliant. It's beautiful, and if you do life in a way where you are content with it not being a straight line, and you're content with it being a wiggly line, as Alan Watts would say, he always talks about wiggly lines, and if, if you can get down with being wiggly, then I find that you can be happy more easily. So I find that, for example, that people who live in straight lines where things are defined and linear and expected and this stuff, that these people um, can often accomplish um, a lot of things, but they're not necessarily... Well, there was a fly, sorry, make me jump. They're not necessarily the happiest people. The happiest people are the people who can alchemize their life into something beautiful, no matter what it is, and no matter what it throws at them. Um, and so, yeah, in my life, for example, uh, there's been, there's been some hardship in my life and I'm very grateful to it because I think it's shown me how, how to create contrast and how to enjoy contrast. And I think that when I make music, one of the challenges is to be as open as you can to your own palette of honesty. And so what comes out when you create, it often will often teach you a lot about yourself, um, this isn't necessarily true when you, you know, when you create for a reason. Like if you create, for example, to like impress someone, like I want to impress a girl or I want to like pass an assignment or sell lots of records or this kind of thing. Um, but when you, when you sit down and you, and you really sing, like you really create as a, you're sitting, you're being spontaneous. That there is an amazing place to learn the apparatus of dealing with your life. And so for me, I find that music has brought me out of some of the, some of the darkest places I've been in. And it's not because I've been, able to convert the dark places into light places is because I was able to let the dark places be dark. And at, by creating through them, um, I was able to, I, I like the word alchemize because there is something almost magical about music, but when you take a force in your life and you open it out instead of shying away from it and you say, you know what, I'm feeling like this today. Let's, let's unpack this. Let's see how this feels. That's really special. And you really feel it as an audience member. So I recently wrote a song called He Won't Hold You that just came out like a week ago, or even less than a week ago. A week ago today, I think it was, actually. And um, the music video for that dropped yesterday, as I'm sure some of you guys know. And that song was a really good example of a song that came from a place of, of doubt and unknowing, and it came from a place of darkness. Now, I don't mean darkness in a scary way. It's not like I'm Darth Vader or something. Though, however, no, yeah. Um, it, it's, more that, uh, it's more that that was a really, it's like a really gentle approach to a mood, which was which is fascinating to me. And so by creating with it, and I, I didn't plan it, you know, I didn't think I'm going to create in this way for the, da. it just came out. And I think that I practiced, um, I practiced letting my emotions come out when I play. Um, my mom has been super, she's always been super big on that. Like you have to, you have to play, like play what you wish for, you know, like play, play what you, yeah, play, play what you long for and stuff like that. Um, but for me, I think that when you're composing and producing and mixing and arranging and making sounds and, in a room like this, it's so special, the number of sounds that you can make. Um, but that process becomes so beautiful. And I really think that's lovely. And so I think that the, answer, the direct answer to the question, how do you stay excited about making music when you're in a bad mood, is to write the bad mood into the song instead of trying to 
it's just, instead of trying to speed up the bad mood so that you can get back to making music again. You know, like, don't rely upon a good mood to make something good. It's, like, so interesting when you're... Again, I go back to what I said before, but if you're uncomfortable or if you're curious or if there's something you're questioning and you put the questions into the into the piece and it affects your choices, that's gorgeous. You should do that. Um, I, it's, it's definitely what I aim, I, aim, I aim to do for myself. And it's not always easy, especially when you're under pressure and you haven't got much time and stuff. But... Um, that's why that's why I love it so much. I love the language so much because it's so real, and it makes you makes you uh, colourful, you know. So uh, yeah, I would just say I would say lean into your moods, use them to your advantage. Like David Byrne uses his voice to your advantage, to his advantage. Okie dokie. Um, hi everyone. It's so nice to see you. Um, people have been really, really, really lovely to me in these comments, you are being very, very lovely to me in these comments. And I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for being here. Let's, let's keep on answering questions and, uh, let's also keep signing some posters. Uh, Ooh, man. <sighs> hmm. There were some good ones. Hmm. Oh, you wouldn't believe some of these. You wouldn't believe some of these. Okay. Linny.ng is asking a very, very difficult question, um, but I will try my best to answer it. The question that is being asked, for those of you who are interested, is, and uh, you can see for yourself if you are not interested, so it's fine. But the question is, do you have advice for someone who has a hard time coming up with good lyrics? So... The, the answer is yes, but I, that's not the end of what I'm going to say. Um, oh, sorry. It's got a bit overzealous there with my uh, poncho, which you can buy if you want to on my website. Um, so imagine there are two characters. This is one of the best pieces of advice I ever received, and I received it from an incredible uh, man, a, a music educator called Pete Churchill, who some of you may actually know. He's from London. Uh, well, he, he's, he's in London. And yeah, Pete Churchill once said... So I asked him the same question. I said, hey, uh, all I ever seem to write about with lyrics is just like my, you know, my own universe. And that's not big enough. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like big enough. So how do I open it out? How do I start writing about real shit? You know, like stuff that's not just going in circles and glowing metaphors and all this stuff. And, and he said, imagine there, there are two characters. Now, now this can be, this can be a, a, however abstract you, you need it to be. You know, some, some people write a song there's actually a duet and there are two people singing and there's one side of the story and the other side of the story. And that's totally cool. Um, but for me, the interesting thing about that is that you can take that in so many directions. You know, like, for example, He Won't Hold You, the song I wrote called He Won't Hold You, is not really one person talking to the other. It's more like two people exploring a theme sort of against each other, using each other. I wrote a song called In the Real Early Morning, actually, right after hearing this advice from Pete. Um, and I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys know the song the real early, in the in the real early morning, but um, it's a it's it's essentially a song about uh, it's on in my room. It's my first album, and it, it's a song. Hi, Laura. Uh, it's a song about uh, it's, it's a, a basic interaction. Well, not a basic, a very complicated interaction with a uh, with um, me as one person, and uh, like a female, uh, an abstract female character is the other character. And there are many women in my life who are very important to me. Um, but I wanted to open up the uh, the song so that it, in one way it's my daughter, who I don't have yet, or maybe will never have, but maybe will, I don't know. I would like to have. Um, and maybe it's uh, my mother, who I know and love dearly. Um, sister, uh, friend, because guiding guiding spirit. Um, and, and so I, I began this dialogue with this other person. And it's not that the other person's there talking. It's not like, and you know, and like I said this and she said this and we you know, got married, you know, whatever like that. It's like, um, it's like I'm asking a question to somebody else. So that was really useful to me. Imagine two characters. Imagine two people on different sides of, of a window pane or different sides of a tree or on different sides of their day, one at the beginning, one at the end. What would the perspectives be like from either side? Or imagine um, you now and you in the future. Or you now and you in the past. Or you in the future and you in the past, not you now. Um, or imagine uh, 
imagine there's so, there's so many so many people to imagine. Imagine imagine speaking with your great great grandmother. That's a cool conversation. Uh, like when you're exactly the same age, when you're both twenty five. In abstract, you're abstract. You can do whatever you want. Imagine imagine a conversation, or, or imagine that you are not in the equation at all. And sometimes it's the most interesting of all. Imagine that it's just it's two people, and and you're explaining something from the perspective of one of them, for the ears of the other, or these two people aren't necessarily communicating. They're actually maybe they're non they're not communicating. Maybe they're they're not they're not looking each other in the eye. Why why aren't they looking each other in the eye? And and how can how can you explore that? How does it feel to not look someone in the eye? Like how does that feel to you in your life right now? You you, pro- you probably know the feeling of not being able to meet someone's eye because either you're afraid that you might laugh, or you're afraid that you might cry, or you're afraid that um, you might fall in love with them, or you're afraid that uh, they might judge you. There's so many interesting stories to tell. Um, um, obviously, this is just this is just yeah, just just one idea, uh, but run with it it'd be super cool if you wrote songs now <laughs> i'm sure you already are writing them right as i as i speak as i'm writing my signatures on these jesse one of three posters that you can buy on my website if you'd like to you're probably writing really interesting songs about interaction so i pr- probably need say no more uh yes you can people are commenting yes can we buy these yes you can um i'm signing these basically for that reason so that you can buy them look this is oh i was hoping i'd get a reflection or something yeah you, uh, you, you do you. You buy a poster. They glow in the dark. I'm not lying. They glow in the fucking dark. So later, you will, well, later in the day where you receive them and it's been in a light place, you will put them on your wall and they will glow in the dark and you will be happy. And you will remember I breathe on these posters and that may turn you on or it may turn you off and it's all good. So anyway, that is a little bit of advice for, for, for lyricism. I'm I'm still learning all this stuff, um, this lyricism stuff. I don't think that you... I can't remember what I was going to say. <sighs> okay. Okay, then that's fine. Here's another question. Supermind underscore Soundscapes, good username, is asking, as a listener, have you ever wished you could adjust and interact with music while you're listening to it? Now, this is a very interesting question. As a listener, have you ever wished you could adjust and interrupt the music while you listen to it? Um, yes, because, uh, well, let me tell you a little story. So when I was younger, I was introduced to a group called Take Six, a group of singers called Take Six. Have you heard of Take Six, y'all? Let me know in the comments um, if you have heard of Take Six. If you haven't, you're in for a massive treat. Um, picture this, right? I was f- uh, 15 years old. I was really most like the thing in my life that made me like probably the happiest was chords on the piano or in the in the voice uh but i haven't really done a huge amount of listening to a cappella music other than like classical choral music from england uh so here here comes this group take six right it's six black guys with voices like velvet um they met on campus at the oakwood university in huntsville alabama shout out to this incredible university 
uh, in a choir called the Aeolians of Oakwood University, who are, as I'm sure some, some of you guys know, amongst my favourite people in the world, conducted by Jason Max Fernand. Unbelievable, unbelievable human beings. Um, Seventh day Adventist choir. And so I, I checked out take six after people were like, you have to check out take six? I was like, oh, I don't know, man, it's, I'm bored. Blah, blah, blah. Like, I, I don't, you know, people ask you to check things out. And they're like, you will love this. And then you're like, okay, then I won't check it out because I don't want to. Um, anyway, after a while, I checked them out and it was super cool. I, I mean, it actually completely changed my life to, for want of a better, uh, for want of a better life. And uh, there's a song of theirs called He Never Sleeps. And it's just phenomenal. And there's another, there's another uh, song of theirs called uh, A Quiet Place. It was arranged by Mervyn Warren. I mean, it's just ridiculously cool. Beautiful, beautiful harmony. Super spiritual, super heartfelt, just gorgeous. And what I used to do is I used to sing uh, the seventh note in every one of the chords that they were singing because they are sick people. And as some of you who play piano or don't play piano may know, um, there, is, um, there are seven notes in every scale normally. And so there's always a note you're going to add to a six-part chord that is consonant, <laughs> even, tradi- even in traditional terms, consonant with the song. And uh, so that was so that was fun. I, it was fun to realise that. I'm just going to get up like this. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that was fun to realise. So I used to be like, ooh, 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 ee, like find the note in all the gaps because the gaps is where the juice is, all the juice is in there. So, sorry. So yeah, um, I, I basically, I do. I, they'll answer the question directly. Um, I do, I adjust and check the music while I'm singing all the time because you can do that with your ear and your brain and your voice. Um, this U bass that I just played uh, here, for example, I was kind of noodling, but um, I take this on family holidays and I sit in the back of the car, or actually the front of the car normally, and I play along and and mess with the music that I'm listening to. Uh, so I do, I do that. I also sometimes wish I could climb in and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa turn down the trombone, <laughs> you know? Nothing wrong with trombonists, don't start a fight, but sometimes it's, the mix is a trombone heavy and I, so I want to go and turn it down. And it's, it's one of the perils of being a, you know, being a, a music producer is that you start listening to music in the same way that you create it, um, which is a very similar process to creating music as you listen to it. And as many of you guys may do, uh, many of you guys may listen to music. Uh, I find myself, um, I find myself responding to the music I'm listening to emotionally uh, on a very similar axis to the axis to w- in, in which I create. So if, I, for example, I'm having a day where I'm just, all I can listen to is like early Bonnie Bear and I'm just like weeping s- softly, then that's probably the best, that's probably the most e- effective uh, axis to put to use with my energy because I have a, a response to it. And so, in, like, you know, when it's like some days you're just like, oh man, I feel this today. This is just like, oh, it's so special. It's so heavy, it's so powerful, it's so gorgeous. And just the, the sensation of feeling really connected to music, it changes every day. Some days I want to listen to like Django Bates and Hermeta Pascual, like insane music, right? And other days I want to listen to William Byrd. And some days I want to listen to Laura Mavulo. It's just in the chat. Um, it, it, it depends. Uh, but certain people and sounds hit the spot for me on different days. And I find that the, the things that like, someone's commenting, I love your shirt. Can I just, can I just make one thing very clear? <laughs> This shirt is for sale. You can buy one if you'd like to. It's actually not even a shirt. It's actually a poncho. But I appreciate the thought. It's the thought that ca- it's the thought that counts. So, you can go ahead and buy one of these ponchos. They're online. It's fine. It's completely up to you. You can do it if you want to. It's by care not guaranteed. It's not coming to purchase. But what I was saying is, if you can if you can follow the stuff that, that excites you, then you can probably create with it. Um, most effectively, you can, you can create with the, those materials m- like m- most effectively. Um, someone's commenting Django Bates interval song, yo, it's a classic, all time classic. Tap into YouTube. Actually, don't do this. Buy the music, <laughs> buy Django Bates's music. Um, he he wrote this incredible song called the Interval Song. Someone's commenting arrange all star. I've got you bass, so I may as well just do. Uh, what key should we do this in? Um, uh, E, should we do an E?
Shine if you don't glow. Ooh, ooh. Hey now, you're in the storm. Get your shoes on. Ooh, hey now, live it inside. Get your soul on. Get free on that cadet. Ooh, there's a math in the base. Only shoes inside. Okay. That, I think, answers that question. Uh, let's move on and answer another one. Um, Here's a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a good one. A dot underscore Rav has a, has a query. And the query is, is this. The query is how to memorize good shapes. This is a question that you can answer in a myriad of ways, which is why I chose to answer it today for you all. Um, I, would, uh, I would hazard a guess that this question appertains to shapes within... Uh, music, music within musical instruments, namely even key, like keyboard keyboard instruments or guitar shapes, like on the fingerboard and stuff like this. Um, I suppose guitarists are the most shape-based musical creatures that exists in the world currently. Um, but <clears throat> I find I find for me that I visualise a lot of shapes, like harmonic shapes within the piano. But I've also recently started. Um, Visualize them on the harpeggi. Let me just get my harpeggi out. Oh man, my legs are all creaky. Very creaky indeed. Okay. Here's my harp harpeg. I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do a little I'm gonna do a little heart in the in the top left hand corner of this poster because it's the one that I put the harpeggi on. So if you get this one, then you know. Uh, you know what's what's good, and you can or, you can order post. Sorry, uh, sorry to keep saying this, but you can order posters. I'm signing these posters. You can order them online. You can get a signed glow in the dark Jesse Volume Three poster for your own, basically your own, your joy, your own sense of joy or sorrow, pleasure, varying kinds of pleasure you can get from this kind of a poster. So, I I just I, I mean people keep talking about the harpeggi and, and for good reason. So as far as shapes are concerned. The incredible thing about the harpeggi, which is why it appealed to me so much, is because you have to learn a whole new set of shapes. So, for example, on the piano, right, you play a major chord, a shape is shapes like this, right? Um, yeah, like this. And you learn, you learn to visualize, like, yeah, the, the, the shapes in, on the instrument. And you can put this shape up here, up here, up here, invert it. Right? And it's all, all good fun. On the guitar, it's a whole different set of shapes. Yeah? Open window. Where should we go? Something out there. Something looming out there. It's very exciting. Oof. Okay. But on the harpeggi, the shapes are so new. It's so insane. Uh, the instrument is capable of things that the piano is not capable of because it's basically half... Uh, it's like half like a guitar and half like a, like a piano. So if you look at the instrument, you can see that the, there's black and white dots and those actually correspond to the black keys on the on the piano um and and the white ones are the white keys but that that somehow doesn't make it easier to uh to, to learn because yeah basically you have to you have to figure out the the shapes that make the most sense so the thing about the harpeggi it's not it's not plugged in right now so you can't really hear it that well but you basically say so you're climbing up the, the instrument you kind of want to go in this direction because it's it's you're not like the first time i played i did this because I thought it was just like a guitar with frets, you know, with pull-offs and stuff. You can do pull-offs. Um, but the cool thing about the instrument is that you can you can move this way too, and you can do these clustery chords, right? I'm trying to play with one hand here to explain what's going on. So a triad on harpeggi is this shape, um, and then like a minor triad is this shape, and a sus. Oh, okay, suspended second. Right. I don't really use my thumb. Corey Henry uses his thumb when he when he plays harpeggi. Does someone say Corey Henry's in the house? <laughs> if you hear Corey, my, man, you're such a you're such a uh, you're such a dude. Corey is like the best harpeggi player I've ever heard. Um, but yeah, ba basically, what you do, what Corey, what Corey plays with his thumb, don't you? Don't you, Corey? Um, I haven't got good enough to to do really do that yet. Um, 
but I tend to use my fingers just to make scales and stuff happen. And so in the left hand, you can do these stretches, um, you know, like you can do like a tenth. It's like so easy to do. Corey, he's here. So nice. What is up, brother? Uh, yeah, you can do sh shapes like this, which on the piano are like really big, but on the harpeggi, they're nice and tender. But the reason I got excited about this is that you can do these sequences. Oh man, just climbing up the instrument and doing beautiful stuff, right? But the, the, even just working your way down a scale in thirds is like a whole different kettle of fish from this bad boy. So uh, the question is, how, yeah, how do you memorize good shapes? Um, I think the best way to memorize anything is to use it uh, in the same way that the best way to, to memorize a language is to use it uh, when you're going to speak it. And... Um, the best way to memorize shapes on a guitar is to jam with your mates. And the best way to memorize uh, shapes in, within verbal reasoning is to solve verbal reasoning problems and uh, stuff like that. So I, I think that uh, or I always have the kind of brain that works quite visually. Like I have quite a good visual memory. It's better than uh, other, other kinds of memory that I possess. But the harpeggio was like such a challenge um, because, yeah, it was just totally brand new with shapes. It was like every shape was... Or something I was learning from scratch and that made it really beautiful and challenging I, I love a challenge um, uh, like one thing one thing I've loved to do recently is is I don't know if you can really see this but like pull off my strings like this I really love that so you have to visualize the shape above the shape and then you have to pick off within that shape because you can't do random uh, so that note's wrong. Well, not wrong, it's just a... No. So I'm visualising this shape up here, and there's a shape down here. So I, I could literally play the harpeggio all day, as I did over Christmas. It's when I really, really got into it. Anyway. Oh, jeez. Oh. Um, yeah. Shapes. I, I mean, I also just love shapes in general. I'm, I'm such a shape guy, you know. You catch me at the shape market on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, there's all sorts of good shapes in the world. Uh, I, I have a query. And the query is to all of you Americans, um, if you are in the chat right now. And Corey Henry, you, you're, you're one of them, brother, so you can, listen, you can ask this if you want to. But when I say trapezium, do you say trapezoid? Let me know in the comments. If so... I don't endorse you at all. I mean, I don't endorse your use of the word trapezoid. I think the trapezium is the correct word. Bruh. So, what do you think? Eddie Benjamin's in the house. What is up, dude? It's good to see you. you, you you're saying you do use trapezoid. Man, you guys suck. Well, no, you actually don't suck. Trapezoid? Are you kidding me? No. Oh, the lid came off. Trapezium. Trapezium is the correct word. Just as aluminium is the correct word. Troy's in the house, what's up Troy? Just as aluminium is the correct word, just as garage is the right word, and not garage, um, just as you say semi, detached, not semi, none of that. Man, today's, today's live stream is turning out to be quite a, uh, quite a British, um, <laughs> sort of a, yeah, British, uh, British spout, <laughs> something. It's not my, I'm British, it's me, that's, that's what I am. I'm, I'm a British man, but trapezoid, I'm not having any of that. Trapezium, it's such, do you think it's such a gorgeous word, trapezium? Don't say trapezoid, I see you in the comments there, don't do that. I'm not having that. Um, I'm going to take off my poncho, it's just really warm, it's really warm. This poncho is yours, you can you can buy this, if you, <laughs> you can buy this poncho online at the jacobcollier.com store. It's the truth, it's the truth of the matter, you don't have to, you really don't have to, but it's super comfy. And it's warm, as, I, as I'm basically showing it. It's really soft on the inside. Oh, gorgeous. Perfect as a, as a gift for um, somebody who's just about to have a baby. Know anyone like that in your life? Um, if so, something else, yeah. This, this is really good. <laughs> Buy it. But, um, what was I, was I going to say? Poncho. <laughs> poncho. Buy the poncho. Uh, so now we're going to spend a bit of time in the t-shirt. This is also for sale. 
if you want to buy it, it's a yourself, J Quality T-shirt based on J Quality artwork for Jesse Gordon 2. Jesse Gordon 3 is about to come out. It's all good though. Don't worry about it. So coming out on August the 14th. Okay. So now we've talked about memorizing shapes. Um, I'm pregnant from your music. Someone is Jack is saying this is. I'm quite surprised to hear that to be honest. Um, it seems uh, seems unlikely. You know, I, I would expect you're probably using it as a metaphor to say that you enjoy the music that I'm making. And I'm really ap appreciative of that. It would be unlikely to have impregnated you as a man with, um, as in not me as a man, but you are a man. Um, and so the fact you're, that you're pregnant is unlikely. And then, you know, mu musical, I, I don't know about don't know about that. Still, thank you. I mean, I really appreciate that a lot. Um, Clara is here. What's up, Clara? It's good to see you. There's a lot of good people in the chat today. That's the honest truth of things. Um, so we're going to continue this little Instagram live session uh, with a little bit of a, I'll ask you more questions. More questions. Oh, well, here's one that doesn't require any kind of uh, writing. So somebody's asking me to show us, as a, I say us, I mean you, because uh, the percussions behind me. So let's do that. Let's have a look at what's going on here. This is my haphazard drum setup, which has been... Uh, sort of turned upside down over the course of quarantine. So this is a glockenspiel, which is a percussion instrument. This here is my drum set. This actually is a surdo, and surdos are normally played upright. <laughs> and when I go on tour, which is not today or tomorrow or the next day, I have a surdo on stage and I play the surdo as a kick drum with my hands so I can go like... You know, which I can't do with my feet as a non-good non non at footwork drum set player. So... I've toured with this, as you can tell, because it's all battered. I toured the whole of Europe with this solo, but it, right now it's my kick drum. It sounds really good. Um, and the, the, I did this Tiny Desk concert, like I did it here. It was like, went from here to here. And I basically sat in this very room without posters. Look at that poster, gorgeous. Oh, you should buy one. Um, I, I, sat, I sat here and I had to figure out where to have a kick drum because I, I realised that I didn't have a kick drum. My actual real kick drum is actually in storage right now with the rest of my touring gear. But this was at home when lockdown began. So put a drum, put it on science, sounds pretty good. Bongos, um, which I toured Europe with as well. They're really good. Beautiful sizzle cymbal made by Murat Viril. Uh, my favorite cymbal in the world, actually, that one. It's funny you should ask. Crash cymbal here by Paste. There's a stag splash. Everyone needs a stag splash. Murat Viril splash and a little cup chime. And this is a hi-hat, my, my OG hi-hat from when I was like a teenager, which I really love. Um, Tom's that are out of use currently. There's a little cushion, one of my chartered cushions. There's two snare drums down here. One is like a big <laughs> and the other one's like a <laughs> and this one's like a <laughs> I'll show you, this one's really nice. Super, super brisk. So, pissing off the neighbours. <laughs> no, all good. Yeah, so I, I, have, I have three different sized snare drums uh, because I think that it's important to mess around with different sized snare drums uh, and so I figured, out, I figured out that that's useful. This is my spoons, which I use as like an alternate hi-hat. It's a really nice alternative to the, yeah, I just said that, hi-hat. Like this kind of thing. C414, macking up the snare. Um, this, uh, the kick, I use, I actually use this P, PR48 on the kick, which is, Kind of a bit like a tom mic, but you can use it for a kick if you want to as well. Um, yes, they are really spoons. People asking you, yeah, really spoons. I'm a huge fan of spoons. I have a musical instrument called the harmonizer, and uh, I built it with my friend Ben Bloomberg. And it, you, I sing and I play chords, and then I um, then out comes harmony. And I can actually control the harmonizer with a set of spoons <laughs> attached to pedals, so you can freeze, you can latch. Um, there's like an alternate freeze function, and so I can create this infinite sustain, infinite reverb using it, which is really satisfying. Um, spoons, I think they're really useful. Uh, and, and this, I suppose, extends to the percussions behind me if I'm sitting in this position. These are some djembes. Um, this is one I was, I was gifted in Cleveland five years ago when I went on a little trip. Uh, this is a djembe. Um, it's, a, it's a really like a high-pitched djembe. Bah! And this one's like a low-pitched djembe. This is one of my first musical instruments ever, actually, this beautiful pulse djembe. Some tambourines and metronomes up there. It's a quicker. Oh no, actually that's, no, that's not the quicker. That is the quicker. Sorry, I get them mixed up. That's a jug. It's just a jug from the kitchen. Lava lamp. Very nice. Uh, kalimbas and stuff. And so, piano, yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, basically this is, that's my percussion. 
Uh, and there are other things too. There's tablet up here. This actually is a bottle of, a, I believe it's vodka. I think it's Polish vodka. Uh, I actually haven't opened it because it just look, looks so nice. Uh, I don't often drink that much vodka either. It's quite, quite extra extraordinary tasting. Anyway, I just like it because it looks like a musical instrument. It makes me feel comfortable. And here there's some other, other instruments, talking drum in there, and there's a little singing bowl. I was gifted in India. I went to Mumbai and did some shows, and someone gave me this beautiful singing bowl, which I really love a lot. Just boxes of treasures and things I've made or found over the years. Um, anyway, that is the answer to your question. <laughs> oh, actually, the answer to the question is, yes, I can show you. I just, I just decided also to do so. Uh, thanks for sticking around. <laughs> And this is great. So we can now we can continue with the with the signings. Hi from Colombia. Hello from London. It's good to see you. Um, can I play the tableau? Well, I I can I can make a sound out of it. I can I can make it go, but I can't I can't really play the tableau. I'm not a tableau master. They say it takes three li three lifetimes to master the tableau, and to be completely honest, um, I'm quite busy. <laughs> But still, I think that I think that the tablet is beautiful, incredible, incredible instrument with a massive legacy behind it. And thus, I have one and um, I use it like I played. What I played the tablet in, you ask? Well, I played it in There's a song of mine in my room called Down the Line. And there's tablet on that. And there's also a song of mine called Hajanga. And there's a. Yes, there, uh, there's there's tablet on that, too. I played tablet on Ocean Wide Canyon Deep, which is a song I composed for Jesse Volume 1. What else have I done? Put tablet on sky above. I think there's some tablet on sky above. I don't think anything on Jesse Volume Three has tablet though. Um, it's it's not very tablet. It's not a very tablet piece of work. It's exciting though. I might I might tell you a tiny bit about it because it's like it's the era. So I yeah I just finished it. I finished it like six days ago <laughs> after announcing the tracklist. I was still working on it when I announced the tracklist, but I realised that was the tracklist. Um, it's really exciting. I'm really excited for you to hear it, actually, if I'm being completely honest. Jesse Ray's is on it. T-Pain's on it. You talked about T-Pain earlier on. I don't know if you were around for that. If you were, congratulations. You, like me, have sat through this entire codswallop without ducking out. Um, we're signing posters. So people, are asking, people are asking, what are you doing? I'm signing posters. And they're for you. You can buy them. I'm signing my name, Jacob Collier, on the posters, and they glow in the dark. And so... Feel free to purchase one if you'd like to, but you really, you honestly don't have to. Like, I, I would not be offended at all if you didn't, if you didn't want to purchase one of these. It's fine. Please. Absolutely no need to own something so gorgeous. There's no need. Suit yourself, all right? No stress. Just... Okay. Let's, let's resume. Um, hi from St. Louis. Hi from London. Uh, this is really cool, guys. Okay. Okay, let's do. Uh, let's let's continue with some questions, shall we? I'm loving all these comments. Keep them coming. Um. Oh. Hmm. Oh, there's some really good ones here. Okay. Of all the questions I've been reading, this is one of the hardest. The question is, T or T? And the answer is, stay tuned to find out. Stay tuned. The answer between T and T, it's sometimes, sometimes it can be hard to differentiate between T and indeed T, but the answer is T. Let's put that back there. Yes, yeah, that's fine. I've, I've answered, I've answered the question. Thank you for the question. Um, I myself enjoy drinking tea. I also, as many of you guys will have astutely noticed, I also enjoy um, consuming tea bags. Uh, that's it. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Um, oh, this is a really good one. It's a difficult question. Laura Mavula is just being lovely in the comments. There's no need, Laura, but I appreciate it. Um, 
question here is, what do you think about how you think? And um, to be honest, I, I, I go up and down with this. <laughs> I think sometimes I think that I think brilliantly. And other times I think I think in the worst possible way. Um, I think in many different ways, uh, like many people do. And I think that, I think that what's interesting to me, aside from thoughts, is like what drives thoughts. And I think you can have thoughts that are based in fear. And I think you can have thoughts that are based in, for want of a, maybe for want of a better word, love, you know, acceptance and being open and being, being forgiving and being understanding and sort of viewing, accepting and seeing things. Um, I think that, I think that, the, I think that minds are really extraordinary things. And I think that, uh, I think a lot, I'm thinking about thinking all the time. Ooh, this is a really interesting poster. It's got like a little a glitch in the thing, which makes it look like there's a ribbon going through it. A little heart makes it a ribbon. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've just been informed that the posters have sold out. <laughs> Thank you for selling them out for me. I didn't do that. You did it. And I'm really grateful. I'm just going to keep on signing them anyway, because this is really fun. Um, so I, I, I'm an overthinker and I, I overthink a lot of things. Uh, and I think about thinking about thinking about thinking. And I get into these feedback loops where I have no vestige of present moment. I just have echoes of echoes of echoes of the moment. And that can be really difficult um, because it can make you feel quite uh, quite alone, you know? If your mind is in a place which is not connected to the real world, it's connected to itself, which is connected to itself, which is connected to the real world. It can be a very diluted way of experiencing things. And the way I think about the, the mind, um, one of the ways I think about the mind is a bit like uh, the harmonic series. And don't be afraid and leave this stream if you, if you it's not scary. The harmonic series is a note, um, a fundamental note with overtones rising from it exists in nature. And if I go, you hear the baby little notes, those are overtones. You have them in your mouth as well. You can check them, check them out later. Um, thoughts are like this for me. And like the fundamentals, like the, the present. And the mind operates only in overtones, in an upwards direction. Because the mind is not a camera. The mind is a projector. This is how I think about it. Um, and sometimes I don't think this is right, but I think the mind is a projector. I think it projects all over the world, like all over the world. So when you meet somebody or you talk to somebody or you create with somebody or you listen to somebody or look at somebody or um, whatever, kiss somebody, um, you're projecting the whole time. You're projecting your past and your past will define your present if you're not careful. And so I think it's important and difficult challenge to figure out how to think about thinking because um, it, it can be yeah as I say it can be it can be dangerous to believe all of these projections at, at, that they're all real and and a lot of the thing well I've been thinking recently over this pandemic period actually about um, belief and believing the stuff and my basic opinion <laughs> uh, or belief about the belief system that I'm believing or like basically about belief itself is that uh, it's it's dangerous to believe things because I think that the more you believe, the more you're certain of, and the more you're certain of, the the how can I put this? The less present you're open to, because I think that if you're certain of something, then you'll bring that certainty into every experience that you have, and you'll meet someone and say, I know what kind of person this is, or you'll listen to a piece of music and say, I know what kind of music this is, or you will travel somewhere and you say, I know what kind of restaurant this is, or I've tasted this before, I know what the kind of thing is. So people love being certain. People love it when they're certain about things. And I love it too. I'm very addicted to it. I'm addicted to thinking, this is a framework that works. So I understand the framework, but it doesn't help you always. It can sometimes help you. But for me, I think the interesting premise is what, what if you didn't believe anything? What if there were no beliefs and you were just present instead and, and you weren't concentrated on on being certain uh, about anything being one way. Uh, I think that, obviously it's a huge question, I, I don't know the answer, but I've been experimenting recently with, with creating from a perspective of being un uncertain, more than being certain. Um, and a, a belief is, I suppose, yeah, when you, when you run with a, with a certainty and it, it forms things, and human beings are so good at doing this. I think it's very interesting, the way that, the, the, the way that people 
do it and they'll, they'll as i say project it on, on, every, on everything everything in the world they'll say oh we can understand that we can break that down but the truth of the matter is you can't break it down and i think it's extraordinarily interesting when you realize that if you say oh here's a flower let's take the flower apart and see how it fits together and then we'll understand what a flower is that's not right because i think that um because because by taking apart the flower you just make it more and more difficult to understand flower is very simple just smells like a flower but i think that people like to take things apart put them back together again and say that they learned something and you can definitely learn from observing things like this but for me with music as somebody who's basically taken apart music to, to the maximum and put it back together you don't necessarily learn more um about what makes music feel a certain way by doing that uh than if you than if you just listen to it and i think that the important thing when you create music if you're interested in doing such a thing as that as i am is how to yeah balance your the, the thinking that you have that you feel like you want to hold on to and it's fine to want to do that's very natural mixed with the, this uncertainty that this perpetual feeling like nothing is ever really fixed and nothing is ever a, a straight line um and so maintain this kind of this, this kind of openness and this I, I struggle with this i really do um because my brain goes so fast it goes so fast and um there, there are many things in, in my life that I will look at or experience and I'll want to make a connection with something I've seen before or heard before. I'll say, look, this is the same as this, the same as this, this is it. And I'll make these global statements about stuff. I'll say, well, this is all this kind of thing or this is all belongs here and here. And, and the, the truth of the matter is that if you, even if you look at the same thing from one day to the next, your projection of what that thing is has changed. And so... It's just important to know that just how much you, how much of you, you give out. There's something that I once read. In fact, I read it. Uh, there's an incredible Instagram. You guys are on Instagram right now. You know what I'm you know about Instagram. There's an incredible Instagram page, which I follow called the, um, the Holistic Psychologist. She's, she's really, really good. And she posted something a few months ago, which has really stuck with me, which is um, people's behavior is simply how they feel about themselves. And... Uh, to be honest, I was very relieved to uh, read this because I think that it's true. And I know that my behavior is often how I feel about myself too. Um, I think if I'm in, if I'm in a space where, um, I, where I'm accepting myself and I'm enjoying myself and uh, I'm, working, I'm working with myself and I'm on my own side, then I'm often like that to other people. And if I'm gr a grumpy old gizzard one day, then that is how I'm to other people towards myself as well. So I think it's, uh, it's important to realize um, that people are such projectors and it's okay. It's not like it's bad to be a projector. It's actually really beautiful. Um, but it's nice to realize it because I think it, sometimes it just helps things, helps you step away from things and realize what's important and what's real. And very little is actually real, I think is what I'm realizing. Um, anyway, does that make, does that make sense? Uh, this is quite a, uh, quite a lengthy and rambly answer to a question, but it was a good question. I, kind of question I think about thinking about often. Okay, um, we're, we're down to the last few p posters, um, and uh, that's really cool. But there is uh, there's time for a few more questions, so please keep keep the questions coming. Um, contact your close family and friends if you'd like to uh, bring them on board, and uh, let's uh, let's 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 do this. Mm, oh, oh! I accidentally clicked on this, but I can answer it. The question is: Any tips for mastering a track? Do you master all your own stuff? So some people are often ask me, like actually the other day my family asked me, they said, hey, JC, um, what is mastering? And I said, uh, I said, well, let me tell you right now uh, what mastering is, because it's very interesting to know what mastering is. So, so this is how a process works, right? You, you write a piece of music and you record it. You record the piece of music and... Um, once you've recorded it, you're probably going to do a bit of mixing, you know, like sculpting away. And you think, well, this wants to breathe here, or this wants to unbreathe here, or this is wants to open out or close in. And uh, for me, a lot of the recording process is actually really simultaneous with mixing, because uh, mixing and, and recording, especially in, in a room like this, it's, it's mu much less about sitting down and playing a whole take on an instrument and then coming back to the drawing board. It's, it's more about experimenting as I'm going and kind of painting a, 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 a picture of stuff, saying like, oh, here we go. Let's make some space, it's a detail here, whatever. 
And so mixing for me is, is very similar to a production. So I, I do, I do all, the, all the mixing stuff here in this very room. Um, and mastering is what happens when your music is finished, basically. So you say, okay, I've just finished Jesse Volume 3. This was me like a couple days ago. I was like, okay, I've just finished Jesse Volume 3. Oh my God, I can't believe it. And then I sent it off to mastering. And I, I work with this incredible mastering engineer. His name is Emily Lazar. And she's one of the most legendary sort of young mastering engineers in, in, the, in, in the business. She's like a bit of a pioneer. She's incredible. She wants to Jesse Volume 2. And she's also just finished mastering Jesse Volume 3. I got the masters back yesterday. They sound cool. And what she does is she takes a mix that I've done, a mix that I've created, um, which is basically finished. Like this is, this is the track. And she will... Um, she, she won't climb into that track and start mixing it because she doesn't have the, the control to do that. She takes that one stereo track and she will sprinkle goodness on it. And sometimes she'll unsprinkle goodness or unsprinkle badness. Uh, there are many things that you can do as a, as, a, um, as a mastering engineer. You know, you can sculpt the low end, for example. You can bring out the high end or you can muffle things down or you can connect stuff and you can stretch things out. You can make things wider and narrower than the stereo image. Um, you can make things hit really hard <clears throat> and make things be gentle and non-abrasive. You can uh, you can over, you can you can compress stuff so it sounds like really glued together and really <laughs> or you can keep it really open. Uh, and so I find it really valuable to have another pair of ears at some point in the process because obviously my ears are basically the only ears in the in the process up until it goes to mastering, um, unless I share something with friends and ask them their opinions and um, stuff like that. And so I find that having Emily sprinkle her little bit of goodness on, on the end of the product is a really nice perspective because she might say like whoa this and this are like totally different levels let's make sure that they're the same volume and stuff like that so obviously when, when an album goes out you want to make sure that the songs flow as you can probably imagine I'm, I'm obsessive about about this stuff like how songs flow from one song to the next um exactly the right amount of time exactly the right amount of space exactly the right amount of high end and low end and i, I work pretty closely with, with ben bloomberg my friend Ben Bloomberg on, on the on the final process of, of creating the album too from from a sonic perspective, and um, he will be really really helpful. And he'll say things like, "There's a bit too much 260 going on here, matey. Got to got to take some of that out." Um, and and so yeah, I'll get to the point where I'm happy with the mix and I'm happy with the spacing, and I'll deliver it to Emily, and she'll put her finishing touches on it as she just did this week, and then bah, boom, it is uh, it goes on goes into the world, it goes on vinyl, and then you can order vinyls for your <laughs> from my website which is great uh, so that that's basically what mastering is and to directly answer the question if you're just joining um, I don't master a track but I do mix it, my tracks to a, an obsessive amount of depth and uh, as far as tips for mixing I think it's just about it's about light and shade it's like if you're a painter like I am I'm not a painter just a just a signy um, and uh, you're the witness and yeah if you're a painter you want to make sure there's enough light and there's enough shade in your in your portrait or your landscape that you're doing, you're creating. You want to make sure that something can breathe in this direction and there's space for it to lean back or space for it to lean forwards. Um, you want to make sure that you can hear all of the details of what's going on. Sometimes you want to make sure that you can't hear any of the details and you want to mash it all together. And there's a song on Jesse Volume 3 called Light It Up On Me. It's one of my favourite songs on the whole album. And it's really, uh, it, it sounds like this actually. <laughs> It's really bubbly, really, really bubbly and really sp like spacious and has loads of depth in it. But there's an interesting section in that where it really crunches. It's like cr so crunchy. And I deliberately like compressed the fuck out of it because I really wanted it to sound like super dense. Um, if, you, if you compress stuff, it's a really interesting sound. You, you know, you, you decrease the amount of dynamic range. So the quietest sound gets louder and the louder sound gets quieter. So if you get like, and you compress it, it would go like, you know what I mean? Because the clap gets quieter and then the air gets louder. That, that's basically what compression is. I've got to, got to face something cool. Compression is, is what education does to people's brains. Sorry to, uh, so, sorry, sorry to break that to you. But um, it's easier to deal with something if everything is on the surface. And if you lay out the raw materials or something without depth, it's easier. So if you listen to the radio, as many of you guys might do, you will notice that... Um, Everything is loud. Even the quietest moments of the tracks, they're all loud. It's really, really loud. Um, I don't mean like loud. I mean like loud. You know, you can turn something down that's been compressed. That's fine. But um, I personally love music with dynamic range. And, you know, that's cool. And I, th I think you will too, actually, just by the way that you look. Looking at me. Um, 
I, I think it's really lovely when you know something can come right down to the down to the ground level and it can breathe right up to the top and it's not hasn't been compressed but I also know that it can be really exciting to compress sound so compression is cool and it's interesting it's interesting psychologically it's interesting to compress your ideas to take the quietest part of your idea and make it as loud as as big as the as the loudest part of your idea um, and it's, it's also it's also interesting to uh, what else is interesting <laughs> what else is interesting um, yeah to when you're having an idea it's like yeah it's like, okay I don't know what I was gonna say it's like if you're if you're a, if it's like if you're a painter go back to what I was saying before if you're a painter and you make everything in the background uh, in the foreground you know you you bring you, you flip it you invert it you invert the background and the foreground so everything that was in the foreground is in the distance and everything that's in the distance is right in front of your nose and that's interesting it's an interesting creative experiment to try things like that um, and so compression brings things closer to each other and I think that that can be cool it can also be a shame but it's up to you to decide as the mixing engineer or mastering engineer that you claim to be so there you go now some people are commenting about like digital versus analog i was brought up in the digital age uh, i do have a bit of analog gear actually uh, there i've got a little i've got a little um actually this some of this is just digital gear like my whole setup runs on, on dante actually but um i have yeah i have some avidas preamps at the, at the top there um and it's 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 cool. It, it's, it's a sound. It's like an amazing sound when you use analog gear for stuff. Uh, so, I what I've realised is that all the plugins. It was like quite a mind blowing moment for me when I realised that all these plugins I was using on Logic, like compressors, they were all built uh, imitating real things, like actual compressors with knobs and dials. Some of you elderly people who are watching, uh, or elders in my opinion who are watching, might be like, "Huh, man, such a millennial." And I would not. I would not disagree with you um that is basically what's going on here but yeah plugins imitate analog stuff and so yeah it's interesting to realize that and to listen to the analog stuff if you can if you possibly can cool. um guys we're, we're, we're almost at the end of this poster thing we've got probably got time for about two more questions so this is basically your final chance today to ask me a question Am I right? Hey. Hey, everyone. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, you're, you're ready? We're going to jump back into the questions. Mm. Oh, my neck is starting to be crickly because I'm looking down and looking up at the same time. You ever know that feeling? Um, wow. What have we got here? Some of these are really deep. Some of these are really deep. <laughs> Some of these are pretty funny. Hmm. Whoa. Whoa. Here's a here's a quick one. Our Nolly Kate is asking, uh, can we be friends? The answer is yes, we can. That's the, that's the answer. We can. Um that, that's it. That's it. Um here's another question. Matt is asking, can we see the posters in the dark? Matt, you'll be pleased to know that we can. <laughs> we can. These are glow-in-the-dark posters. And yeah, you probably won't be able to see yet because it's still light because I'm, you won't see my face. But basically, they glow in the dark. And that, so that's the whole idea of glow-in-the-dark is that you can see them when it's dark. Um, trust. It's, it's mad. Mad times right here. So, so yeah, feel free to... Uh, <laughs> actually, I think they're, yeah, they're sold out, but I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, Oh, it's another one from Arnoli Kate. It's coming through with the questions right here. What has been the best day of your life? Well, I can tell you one of the best days of my life. Uh, it was a time in 2018 when I record, I did a recording session with the Aeolians of University. And you maybe have heard me talk about this before, but it was one of the best days of my life. They're an extraordinary choir. They're so, so good. 
and I went to Nashville to do it. And it was really, really, really special. And I, 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 I'm not going to talk about it for a long time, because you know, but that was one of the best days of my entire life. We recorded for 12 hours with this group of undergrads, this undergrad choir called the Ellen Zurich University. It was just unbelievable. It was really, really cool. I don't know why I'm speaking really quietly, but I just, I figured I'd just speak a little bit quietly. Someone's asking here, um, how many hours do you sleep? That was one of the questions I saw. I, I'm like, you know what? I'm the kind of guy who, if I don't, sp- if I don't speak, if I don't sleep for um, like about eight hours, I, I, I'm not very good at life. So I, I try to sleep, um, I try to sleep for eight hours um, whenever I can. Yeah, I know like, I know other people uh, who can sp- sleep for like three hours and it's, it's like, it's all good. I don't, I'm not that, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I, I like getting sleep. I think the sleep is the one time my brain knows how to can process sh- stuff. Um, you into Kendrick Lamar? So saying, yes, I am into Kendrick Lamar. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we were asking, why is my album called Jesse? Uh, well, Jesse is just a name that I like, uh, but it's also my name a little bit because I like JC. That's kind of my name, but it's not really my name. But I didn't want it to call it Jacob. But that would have been really weird. Look at what's going on down here. Got a whole little sock my foot has decided to exit the sock from the front. That's what's going on. Hello from Australia. Hello from London. The philosophy account that I follow, I mentioned it's called The Holistic Psychologist. You, you'll be into that. Favourite favorite poly, polyrhythms. Yeah, I always, this is like my, my party trick, poly, polyrhythm. But I can actually do two against three against four against five against six, all at the same time on the fingers of one hand. If you don't believe me, then keep watching. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, one. Two, one. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's that's probably my favorite body rhythm because it's the, that's the hardest. And and if I sped that up, you know what you know what you'd hear. You'd hear a major triad. That's a whole different Instagram live stream. But the ratio of four to five to six is actually a major triad because it's the fourth, fifth, and sixth harmonics. Yeah. No worries. It's fine. Yeah. I haven't finished all my posters. You guys are being distracting. I'm going to put you down. And you can keep you can keep talking. Poppadoms or bread. Um, poppadoms or bread. Uh, I I like poppadoms. I like poppadoms. Yeah, I like poppadoms. But there's nothing like freshly made bread. There's nothing like it. So I'd highly recommend that you make yourself some bread. There's a question I do want about what's my favourite smell. The answer is one of, one of the answers is my mum's homemade bread. It's another one of my favourite smells. <sighs> What do you think about tango music? Somebody's asking. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I love it. Piazzolo informed so much of my childhood. In fact, when I was about 14 to 15 years old, I played in a, in a tango band, a little foot, like a folk tango crossover band. And I played double bass and I was the singer as well. And my mom was in the band and two of her amazing friends, Nicola and Steve. And um, it was like my first time I ever performed. Someone's just commenting, just kissed you. I. I don't really believe that because I, I mean, I don't, I have no memory of this happening. I have no memory of just being kissed, but thank you. Thank you. None, the, nonetheless, how do I think I do on hot ones? Probably do horrendously on hot ones. I think I'd hate that. I, don't put me on that. Don't put me on the show. Do you play didgeridoo? Actually, the question is, you play didgeridoo? And the answer is no, no. As Bill Wurtz would say, no. Um, I'm getting kisses from people now. <sighs> Not real ones, but like virtual ones. So I really appreciate. Um, guys, uh, this is the, this is the penultimate poster. This here is the penultimate poster, and then this is the last poster. This is the last one, and because it's the last one, I'm going to do a heart in this corner at the top, and a heart in this corner at the top, and um. I'm going to write thank you. I'm going to write thank you. And then I'm going to write Jacob Collier. 
smiley face. And I'm going to put the lid on my pen. Oh, don't do that. Uh, don't do that at home. And I'm going to put this in my pile. That, my friends, that, my friends, is a bunch of signed posters. And uh, if you, uh, if you, um, if you're just tuning in, I, these are for you. I'm, I'm sending these online on my, my website. And it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> it's good. It's good for you. It's good for me. It's good for everybody. Uh, I believe they're actually, unfortunately for you guys, uh, sold out. Uh, as, on, as I've just heard on this live stream, they actually sold out. So if you didn't get a chance to get one, I, um, I'm, I'm, I apologize. But it actually, it's your fault. Um, and uh, we'll do more. Because this has been really fun. This has been really, really fun. Uh, to answer some of your questions. Fave D'Angelo song. Oh. My favourite Daniel Show song right now is probably One More Gin. Or Gin. One More Gin. It's on Voodoo. Voodoo is one of the best albums of all time. Um, thank you for hanging out with me. This has been great fun. Really has. It's been lovely. Uh, yeah. Cool. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I will catch you guys very soon. Sending lots of love from London. Okie dokie. See you guys. Catch you later. Bye.